David Greber, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity Embark on a fascinating exploration of humanity's past and reimagine our understanding of the complex fabric of social development in The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity by David Greber. Journey through the rich, multifaceted history of human society as we debunk conventional narratives of linear progression and reveal the intricate tapestry of political and cultural realities. We'll delve into a treasure trove of archaeological and anthropological insights to present a more holistic understanding of our ancestors and the countless possibilities of political organization and social interaction that existed in the past. This book summary offers an inclusive perspective that challenges traditional Eurocentric views and uncovers the underlying assumptions and biases that shape our perception of civilization. The Complex Evolution of Human Society Human society did not develop linearly, and both Rousseau and Hobbes' stories are unsatisfactory in explaining its evolution. While society evolved from a pre-civilized state, it also marched sideways, went backward, and stood still. The truth is that early societies were complex and interesting, and there are many more possibilities for political organization and social interaction than we're taught to believe. The book aims to restore our ancestors to their full humanity and challenge the traditional narratives of human society's development. A History of Inequality The book discusses how the civilization of European society was built on the suppression of indigenous people's ideas of individual freedoms and social checks on authoritarianism. The book explores the brutal criticism of European culture by indigenous people and how the idea of true civilization was used to justify the suppression of indigenous communities. The book argues that to understand modern systems of domination, we need to work out why kings, princes, and overseers emerged. The Origins of Societal Hierarchies Humans were once physically and culturally diverse, and the anthropological record debunks preconceptions of their abilities. The Nambiquara people exemplify the fluctuation of social orders according to the season. This suggests that early kings and queens may have only held temporary power and raises the question of when the current permanent systems of inequality emerged. The Erosion of Three Central Freedoms The book explores the three central freedoms that our distant ancestors assumed and why it is hard to maintain them in today's society. These include the freedom to leave home, the freedom to shift back and forth between social structures, and the freedom to disobey authorities without consequence. The erosion of these freedoms began with the development of the idea of property and the emergence of kings and queens. The idea of private property and the sacred led to the creation of exclusive claims over property and demands for unquestioning obedience. The book delves into how these ideas came to order many other aspects of human life. Indigenous California, the Anti-Agricultural Society Indigenous Californians rejected the idea of slavery, unlike their neighbors in the Northwest Pacific, who enslaved up to a quarter of their population. California communities developed social institutions to insulate themselves against slavery, emphasizing industry and self-reliance as opposed to the aristocracy's dependence on a workforce. The rejection of slave-taking in California communities has strong political dimensions, showcasing how decisions about entrenched hierarchies reflect a community's values and ideas about human relationships. This cultural division demonstrates how hierarchy and equality emerged together as complements and how human freedoms came to be lost. The Slow Transition to Farming In this book, the author explains how farming was not an immediate transition for our ancestors. It was a slow and gradual process that started with game play and evolved into serious farming to feed large populations. The transition was not immediate because farming is backbreaking work that requires clearing fields, pulling weeds, and lugging water. Consequently, some communities tried it and quit, or only farmed for part of the year. The shift to farming did not necessarily mean the advent of land ownership or private property. Communal management was, and is, very common among agricultural communities. The Dynamics of Early Cities Early cities, despite being mega-settlements and having millions of inhabitants, did not carry a hierarchical system. 
citizens performed chores collectively and played a role in government through popular assemblies. Archaeological surveys reveal an even distribution of wealth, craft production, and administrative tools across diverse districts. In these cities, small groups with varying theories ran it and would clash in public assemblies, sometimes resolved peacefully, while other times it would lead to violence. Teotihuacan, with at least a million people, had grandeur and sophistication as well as subtly complex social organization without overlords. The community celebrated its collective values, and visual arts depict Teotihuacanos as all roughly the same size. Meanwhile, in smaller hill towns adjacent to these mega settlements, warrior aristocracy developed, living in palaces or forts, heavily armed with swords and spears, rejecting certain features of nearby urban civilizations like writing. Emergence of the state The state is not an inevitability but an outcome of large-scale violence and confluence of the three forms of domination, control of violence, information, and individual charisma. The development of the state wasn't an inevitable step in human evolution or social organization. Instead, charismatic leaders of ancient societies like the Almecs in Mesoamerica and leaders of Chavin de Huantar in the highlands of Peru derived power based on individual charisma and control of esoteric knowledge, respectively, but they weren't states. However, for something akin to a state to emerge, two of the three principles of domination had to be brought together, control of violence and information. This spectacular display of violence happened in ancient Egypt, where kings were buried with their followers, sometimes thousands of them, especially killed for the occasion. Ritual killing was regarded as a sure sign that state formation was underway. On the other hand, the first systems of specialized administrative control emerged in small Neolithic villages, like Tel Sabi Abayad in today's Syria where the bureaucrats kept control of resource allocation. Large-scale agricultural production started with play farming, and it's plausible that political systems like kingdoms also started with temporary play kings who built monumental architecture to project eternal power, just like massive human sacrifices. In essence, the state's confluence was based on control of violence, information, and individual charisma and wasn't an inevitability. Therefore, it's significant to reflect on whether the state is permanent or has the potential to be a transition phase in social organization. The Nonlinear Evolution of Political Systems The demise of Cahokia, once the greatest city in North America, proved that state formation is not the inevitable endpoint of societal evolution. The dissatisfied residents of Cahokia simply walked away, and subsequent communities across North America developed values like political debate, diversity of opinion, and anti-authoritarian sentiment. These values profoundly influenced the Enlightenment thinkers whose ideas form the foundation of modern political thought. This proves that neither social nor political development is linear and that history is far from over. Political evolution and experimentation continue, and the indigenous critique of European colonist political systems offers valuable insights. As we conclude our tour through the dawn of everything, we are reminded that the history of humanity is far more fascinating, complex, and diverse than we had ever imagined. Both Rousseau and Hobbes have been proven to be insufficient in explaining the socio-political development of the human species, as evidence points to a more nuanced, trial-and-error approach. With stories of fascinating early societies, the emergence of agriculture, and the interplay between hierarchy and equality, the book offers profound insights into the foundations of the modern world while illuminating the countless possibilities for political organization and social interaction. Ultimately, we are left with a deeper understanding of human history and its potential for continued development and the realization that our own societal paradigms are not set in stone, but merely one of many paths that humanity could follow 